as you just, this is a partnership with the Southern California Association of Governments, has been partnering with my, the center that I formed after I completed my federal service a couple of years ago. And they are supporting us going out and working with various cities. Calabasas has been one of the cities working with our center this year to examine issues around earthquake resilience and ways in which you can uh, be better prepared for the earthquake. Because, you know, you talked about you turn on and try to listen to me after the earthquake. Listening to me before the earthquake is probably more useful. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's hopefully what we're, we're going to be able to talk about here. Um, so I, I, I know I need to try and keep this brief. I can talk on this subject for a really long time, but I'll try to keep it a little quicker. Um, I want to just ask you to think about what it means to think about earthquake risk. Right? And it's, we think about the faults, but it's actually quite a bit more than that. There's one piece of it, which is what the earth is doing to you. The faulting, the shaking, the landsliding that happens because of it, or the liquefaction that can happen because of it. But that's just the beginning of the equation. What is at risk is what the earth does to you and what we have exposed to what the earth is doing, the extent and density of our built environment and how it relates to our faults. Um, and then, Another, there's a separate issue that's really worth focusing on, which is the weaknesses in that infrastructure. Infrastructure and buildings can be built in a lot of ways. Some of them can handle earthquakes and some of them can't. So uh, it's a separate issue where we are and how we build it. And of course, these are all things that can uh, make the, the problem bigger. Uh, we can also manage the problem by being able to respond effectively. And this is where a lot of us try to work in terms of uh, reducing our earthquake exposure. But there's one other piece that I like to add on to this beyond what we do in, re in responding is how do we handle the recovery? And I talk about the will to recover because what's really at stake is not our lives. You are very unlikely to die in the earthquake. It's like 99.99% of us will be living through the earthquake. Uh, it's far more dangerous to get on the freeway each day. Uh, but what, rather than talking, it's not about dying in the earthquake, it's about living after the earthquake and the future of our cities and society. And so I'm, I'm asking you to take a, a somewhat different look and not just, will I die at that moment, but what's going to happen to the city and are we going to be there? We have a historical preservation. What Are we preserving until the next earthquake or through the next earthquake? How much do we want to have here afterwards? So let's look at what these issues are for us. Uh, here in Southern California, we're in a rather special place, living on the edge. Uh, the plate boundary is usually assigned to the San Andreas Fault, but it's actually somewhat more complex than that. So the San Andreas is the fastest moving fault. We are moving to the northwest at about the same rate as your fingernails grow, a little less than two inches a year. But imagine not cutting your fingernails for 200 years, and you realize that we can really build up a lot of stress between our earthquakes and a lot of offset on the fault. So when the earthquake happens, one side is going to move with respect to the other in a matter of seconds, and it'll probably be distances of 20 to 30 feet um, w when it happens. And in Southern California, we have another problem, and that's because our pl plate boundary is not straight. If you go up to Northern California, the San Andreas runs northwest, the plates run northwest, you basically got the San Andreas and the Hayward, which is, which is parallel to it. Down here in Southern California, we put in a bend. And so we now have to push these plates beside each other, but instead of going sideways, we now run into each other. And we've got a plate boundary that goes more like this. So we run into it. And imagine you were taking a piece of glass and trying to force it around a corner like this. What would happen is the glass would shatter and you'd end up sweeping the shards around the corner. And geologically, that's essentially what's happening here. We break it up with a series of faults. So the fault that produced the Northridge earthquake, the Oak Ridge fault, the San Cayetano fault, the Malibu fault, we have dozens of them around here that are pushing up these mountains. I mean, you probably, a geologist looks at mountain and says, why is it there? Something's pushing it up faster than erosion is bringing it down. Now, most people don't think of it that way, but really in California, when you see mountains, you need to think earthquakes. So if we come in and look here in a bit more detail, here are the uh, biggest faults of Southern California, sort of the top 50. There are, there are 300 that are considered active and long enough to produce at least a magnitude six. And you can see that as we get out here into the Western San Fernando Valley, they start getting a bit more dense. And that's because of this corner 
And the, this area, Ventura County, uh, the, the Ventura Basin, and extending over here to the western San Fernando Valley, becomes the most active part of California outside of the San Andreas Fault because of these multitude of these multiple faults trying to get around the corner. Here's a picture that's just in a little bit more detail as you come in through here. Uh, and those are magnitude fives that have happened over the last few decades. Well, not all of them because, no, it's not the last few decades, just in the last decade. Um, but you can see as the Santa Monica Mountains are being pushed up and then the Santa Susana Mountains are also being pushed up. So you have a lot of faults very nearby. Um, one final th issue about hazard and what the Earth is doing to us. We often talk about magnitude. Magnitude actually probably shouldn't be a public quantity. It's great for the scientists. It's one number that gives us the total amount of energy released in the earthquake. It's not what happens to you. What happens to you is shaking intensity. And in fact, in Japan, they always talk about intensity, not about uh, the magnitude when they're talking in the public about an earthquake. And the intensity is greater if you're right on top of the fault. So there's one magnitude for the whole earthquake, but there's a map of intensities. And I'm showing examples from two earthquakes, uh, the Northridge earthquake, which I'm sure anybody who was here at the time remembers quite clearly, uh, because in fact, you can see you're in some of the highest shaking areas. You're at the edge of the red. Uh, you're, you were at intensity eight in that event, which is, which is the orange between yellow and red. Uh, on, the, on the left, we have the 7.2 El Mayor Kukapa earthquake. And you can see what's different about a bigger earthquake is a longer fault. So it's a larger area affected. What happened here and in the West Valley in Northridge is about as strong as the shaking gets in an earthquake. But it was a relatively confined area. We have a 10 mile across fault, about 100 square miles got the really intense shaking. And the rest of us really weren't that bad off. We suffered from the loss of infrastructure. We suffered from the damage to the electric grid. But we didn't have damage in Pasadena. When we get a bigger earthquake, we're going to have shaking over a much larger area. So as we keep on looking at this, this is actually a simulation of what a big earthquake on the San Andreas Fault would be like. And on the left, you see we have a map that's showing a map of Southern California sort of tilted up on its edge. The red line is the San Andreas Fault. We're assuming that 200 miles of it will go in one earthquake. This is what was called the shakeout scenario. I led a team back in 2007, 2008 to create this picture. And this is the seismology done with high-speed computing that we, we twisted the arms out of NSF to pay for. Uh, and so this is a, a teams of scientists. We're, we're doing this to compare it. Over on the right, we're looking at an overview here of the West Valley. This is set up over Woodland Hills. So you can see Highway 101 and Van Nuys and Burbank off at the eastern end of the valley. I have been talking for 45 seconds. We haven't even started to feel the earthquake here. Right? This is why we think earthquake early warning has some real advantages. We can determine that the earthquake's underway, and you can see by now San Bernardino has been completely devastated by the earthquake, and you're just getting the beginning of the shaking levels. Um, when we look at this overall picture of what happens in the big earthquake, there's a, several things to notice. One, look at how many more people are going to be receiving the extreme shaking that was only here in the West Valley for the San Fernando earthquake. We estimate about 10 million people will get the shaking that about 500,000 people received in the Northridge earthquake. The other thing is how long it lasts. And then the other thing, you've got that red, that red fault there. Every bit on that red fault is moving 10 to 30 feet in the event. So everything that crosses it has now been offset by 10 to 30 feet and, and poses a risk to our infrastructure that goes way beyond what's happening in any individual city. Um, the good news, oh, look at this, it froze. Hopefully yeah. that will happen. Yeah, so the earthquake doesn't quite get to you. You guys are good. Uh, <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, so, oh, then we do something. All right, so here I we as are. Ma I, as mayor, have banned earthquakes here in California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here we are now two minutes into the earthquake, and you can see the, the level of shaking is about, the level of expected damage is about the same as what you got in Northridge. You see it's turning orange there. It's at that yellow to red boundary. It will happen with less intense shaking over a longer time. You saw how long the shaking goes on. And you are not going to be the worse off this time. You are going to be much better off than much of the rest of the people in Southern California. So uh, 
When you look at what your earthquake risk is, you really need to be thinking about two things. What's the earthquake you have locally that causes even more damage here, but doesn't have as big an impact. The Malibu Fault run, pushes up the Santa Monica Mountains and is long enough to be about a magnitude seven. Uh, it could potentially join up with the Hollywood Fault and get up 7.3. The length of the fault determines the magnitude of the earthquake. Uh, but boy, if that earthquake happens, you know, it's going to be a lot worse in Hollywood and Santa Monica than here. So even more, you know, you're going to have other people that are getting the attention. Um, but there's a lot of possibilities. We talk about the San Andreas because it's the fastest moving fault, happens the most often, and affects the most people. But affects you in what way? I said this is only the beginning of the picture. The second thing is exposure. What have we done? You know, and when do we want to put our, our buildings on faults? You might just say that's the solution, let's stay off the faults. And the problem is the answer to that is too late. We've already built our city where we have dozens of faults and we can't d really do anything about either the hazard or the exposure. But now we're getting into the part that we can do something about. So let's start looking at what goes on uh, in, in terms of structural, uh, in terms of our resilience and our, our, our weaknesses. What we are trying to achieve we talk about urban disaster resilience, and this means a city that continues to function after the earthquake. Because the reality is we can't stop all the damage. It wouldn't be in any way cost effective. And remember, you know, if we really wanted to be about safety, we'd be doing something about freeway deaths, not about the earthquake deaths. Um, so what we're trying to do is keep the economy from collapsing after the earthquake. And that's easier said than done. If you look back at what happened to San Francisco in 1906, you can argue that it never regained the status that it had before that earthquake happened. In 1905, the only city that mattered in California was San Francisco. The decade after 1906 is the largest growth decade in the history of Los Angeles as people abandoned Northern California and came south. Before that earthquake, San Francisco was five times the size of Los Angeles. Los Angeles is now five times the size of San Francisco. And, um, that's really, it's that long-term economic part. It's not where we end up emotionally. Emotionally, we're really afraid of dying in that unpredictable earthquake. But when you look at the long-term consequences, people who give up on the, you know, get bankrupted by the earthquake, who give up, who leave the area, that's a really significant issue. Uh, I had population data from Los Angeles, obviously I was just talking about it. The only years in the whole history of Los Angeles where they lost population, were 1971, 1972, 1994, and 1995. The two big earthquakes drove people out of here. And those weren't big earthquakes. Those were what, I mean, I'd call them large, but they're not, they're, they're not the really the major earthquakes. There's a lot bigger that's gonna be coming. So what do we, can we do about it? If we think about this in terms of this urban disaster resilience, how do we function well enough? You need to talk about what is the base of our society. And a modern urban area is based on critical infrastructure. And we talk about these basic systems, our basic utilities of electricity, gas, water, sewer, uh, our communication systems, because a modern you know, economy absolutely needs communication to be able to keep on functioning, and the buildings that we live in. And so you can look at these three categories as being the, the base on which we need to build our city and we need to keep things functioning well enough that we can keep on going. Again, don't have to make it perfect. Imagine we have buildings that are down and people can't go to work, but we still have internet and people can telecommute. You can keep a lot of things going without all of the buildings. Or we lose water, which we're almost certainly going to be doing, but we still have enough transportation. FEMA's got plans for how they're going to be bringing in huge quantities of water. And that can get us through the crisis period and keep going well enough. We need a water system we can repair, though, because how many of you are going to stay here when you haven't had a shower in a month? And if we really don't have water system, that's not the water that FEMA's carting in. They're doing it for our drinking water. Um, on these basic critical structures, we build all of the systems that make for a modern society. And we're trying to keep this system up and going. Um, I keep on saying water. I want to start with that because I think if there was only one thing I could change in California, this is probably the most important one. Uh, when we looked at this big analysis of what the San Andreas earthquake would cost, the fires triggered by the earthquake and that we will not be able to fight because our water systems are broken 
are expected to double the losses, both the financial losses and the casualties. And in the, in the model we, we created, the, the fire doubles the losses. And we had this reviewed by a big team of fire chiefs, the ones who had fought the fires in, in um, Oakland in 1989, in LA in 1994, and the fire chiefs told us, if anything, it was an underestimate. So this is a really major issue in the biggest earthquakes. And then there's also, as I said, we need water to drink. You can't open a business. You can't open a restaurant. You can't open a, a beauty salon without water. You can't do most manufacturing without water. And the models is, you know, when we got all the water companies together and looked through what the big earthquake was going to be, the estimate is up to six months to get water back into all of the uh, um, uh, houses all of the buildings of Southern California and a business that doesn't have water for six months is going to be a business that no longer exists Bus that's about the limit that they think that a business can can hold out on average so this is a it's a big business disruption cost our estimate was 50 billion dollars in business disruption costs from loss of water alone and um, uh, and and then the fires are also a really significant issue uh, another problem in terms of restoring service is the fact that all of the water that comes into Southern California from other areas, the four big aqueducts, all cross the San Andreas to get here, and they all cross the, the fault in the area that would break in our largest earthquake. Because that's, to be a big earthquake, it has to be a long fault. And the, the planning that was done at the state level was like, okay, we have, you know, we could lose an aqueduct, but we have three others. Well, that actually doesn't work because they're all going to break in the same earthquake. We finally got in the state to acknowledge this and at the table, and we're starting to talk about how we can be um, uh, retrofitting some of these, these pipes, but it, it's a real potential issue. If you use groundwater here, that's incredibly important. It's a really big asset compared to other communities. Um, but uh, we're going to have major restrictions on the water availability after the event. Um, the other big issue are historic, the old buildings. Um, you know, your building is as good as the building code in place when your building was built and the degree it was enforced. Uh, and um, there are styles of buildings that we have eliminated in California because they kill people in earthquakes. That doesn't make those buildings disappear. So uh, URMs are the oldest ones that has uh, mostly been addressed in, in this area. Uh, the softer story, um, that tends to be apartment buildings, again, a bit less of an issue, mostly for, for Calabasas. Um, and then we have the pre-1980 concrete buildings. These are potentially the deadliest ones because uh, there's some real weaknesses in the way they're constructed. They failed badly in earthquakes. The law got changed. Um, but concrete's very heavy. So when those buildings collapse, we tend to see the highest life losses within that. And of course, then there's the problem with steel moment frames that was discovered with the, um, uh, the Northridge earthquake. So these are, you know, it's a different risk for each different city, but that whole p issue of retrofitting is a major life safety. It's where a lot of the lives that will be lost uh, you know, will be happening. Um, then the other issue actually is our newer buildings. And uh, I want to point out to you the city of Christchurch. This is a city in New Zealand. It's about 450,000 people. Um, they use the same building code we do. They use the same enforcement mechanisms. It's very, very similar to what's built in California. They had an earthquake in 2011. Uh, it was only a 6.3, but you can see the fault ran right through the middle of the city. And they had um, uh, quite a bit of damage from the event. Uh, the only deaths were in older non-ductile concrete buildings, like I was talking about. This was a TV building built in 1963. It was responsible for most of the deaths. The modern code did exactly what it had promised to do. Nobody died in a modern building. But that is all our code gives us. And they ended up, this is what Christchurch looked like in 2015. They had to tear down 1,800 modern buildings because they were so badly damaged they couldn't be repaired. Our building code is not giving us reusable buildings. It's giving us disposable buildings. They are disposable buildings that won't kill you. But they are, we are building in a huge financial vulnerability. Um, and because of this, I, have, I think this is one of our really major issues. Um, the engineers have analyzed this. They estimate that to build it 50% stronger would add about 1% to the cost of construction. 
So it's not a horribly expensive fix. Uh, there is a bill that just passed the state assembly to uh, uh, develop a, a, what they're calling a functional recovery standard for buildings. How do we create buildings that we can recover the function within a short period of time after the earthquake? And it's now up in front of the state senate. Um, and I think that that's a piece, it's AB 1857 that was pr proposed by Mr. Nazarian, uh, Van Nuys. Uh, you would and have I thought that the name of the city alone would have provided greater protection. Uh, uh, well, and the, the Christ Church is the cathedral in Christ Church, and it was very badly damaged in the earthquake. Um, they are w working at how to rebuild it. It's an interesting uh, church-state challenge because it's a symbol of the city, and yet it's, it's a church. Um, if you ever get a chance to go there, they've built a temporary cathedral that's called the Cardboard Cathedral. And it's literally made out of cardboard, and it's extraordinarily beautiful as a temporary while they, they, they fix up the other church. Um, and just remind you that all of these issues really create huge social repercussions. People are scared of earthquakes. And about the only way to really, I mean, they're going to be scary. There's a part of it that we can't deal with. But uh, if you feel like you are ready, if you have been prepared, if you know what's coming and you know what to do, people can handle it emotionally better afterwards. And I seriously think that the real issue at stake is the future, not of our individual lives, but of our communities.